Hello everyone, uh, my name is Pierre. I'm a software engineer in the Android security team at Google. And um, today I will be talking about the project that my team has been working on for the past few years. And I will focus a bit more on the bits I've worked on. Um, so, what's the, the, that project? So this, this project is called the Android Virtualization Framework. And I will start with a, a bit of a, giving you the context for why we have AVF. Um, so this is sort of Operating Systems 101. Um, if, so you have processes running on a kernel uh, and Android pretty much looks like this to the Android kernel. So apps, uh, system services, HALs, all of those things are processes and including third party applications. And if there is some vulnerability in the Android kernel, and those exist, um, a process could take advantage of this uh, uh, vulnerability, take control of the kernel, and if it gains control of the kernel, there's privilege escalation and you can spy on other apps and basically have access to all of the data that is available on the device and so user data and user privacy are compromised at that point. And so um, looking at this problem, the question is how can we have uh, sensitive applications or sensitive processes run in a way that wouldn't be at risk even if the kernel gets compromised? Um, so the industry has looked at the specification for the main architecture where Android runs, which is ARM. And the ARM architecture defines the concept of trust zone. So for those that are not familiar with trust zone, it basically replicates what, what we have uh, with in Android, with a user space being EL0, Android, the kernel being EL1. In a parallel world, they call the secure world. And uh, they introduce a secure monitor, which manages uh, switches between those worlds. And the advantage of this is that secure code running in the secure world cannot be attacked by any code running in non-secure. And uh, this is typically enforced at the hardware level. Um, and so it's a, it's a very strong guarantee that the architecture the system and CPU architecture provide to that software. So should we move our um, sensitive applications to the secure world? Well, maybe not. And the reason is that in practice, although ARM had intended Trust Zone to be a place where um, highly security sensitive firmware would run, uh, in practice we have um, because the non-secure has to trust secure uh, to not attack it, the, 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 the privileges look something like, like what we have on the right. So anything running in the secure world could, in theory, compromise whatever's running in the non-secure world. And so because those privacy-sensitive applications might be um, highly complex in terms of uh, functionality, there's a probability of them having a vulnerability. And so if an attacker compromises one of those so-called trusted applications uh, running in the secure world, then they might have to compromise perhaps their own operating systems, the trusted execution environment. Uh, but eventually, it becomes almost straightforward for them to attack non-secure. So to attack the Android kernel, and then we are back to square one. Um, so unfortunately, this is the, 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 what we have right now. So this is what the industry decided to do. And there is um, very high level business logic that is running there in Trust Zone today on uh, Android devices. Um, the other drawback of, of Trust Zone is that if there is a vulnerability in the, in the secure software and we want to patch it, it is typically a time-consuming process for, for vendors, and it is usually costly. And so what that means is that um, vendors 
face this choice, uh, having to make a trade-off between the cost of maintaining devices and um, the, the security of the users of those devices. Um, now, looking a bit at Trust Zone from a developer perspective, if you're developing an Android app, um, you write it once, and then you expect it to run on all of the Android uh, devices, mostly unmodified. Um, in Trust Zone, it's different. So you write it once for one TEE, and because there are multiple TEEs, which might be incompatible, um, if you want to port that to another device, which runs a different TE, you, will, you might have to rewrite it, or at least rewrite part of it. Um, and TEs are obviously not as feature-rich as uh, a Linux kernel and, and what, what we can have in the, in, in the Linux world. And so this is also limiting in terms of uh, tooling and infrastructure that uh, developers um, writing trusted applications uh, have access to. So for all these reasons, um, the Android virtualization framework is effectively trying to provide a way to um, run sensitive applications in an environment which, uh, if compromised, if the kernel is compromised, would not get compromised, but on the other hand, could not compromise the kernel if they got compromised. Um, so this is what we had uh, in, in the previous slide. So secure yellow one on one side and uh, non-secure yellow one on the other side. And we, in, with AVF, are adding a hypervisor. And so the hypervisor runs at this EL2 execution level. And it allows uh, protect, what we call protected VMs, and I will define this term uh, in a moment, but to run. And so then those um, sensitive applications can run inside of those protected VMs. And so in, in the same way as with Trust Zone, if the Android kernel gets compromised, because the hypervisor is enforcing the separation between the, the Android, which we call the host, and those protected VMs, then it cannot attack the sensitive payloads that are running inside of the protected VMs. Um, but the big difference with Trust Zone is that protected VMs cannot attack the host because the hypervisor um, has this mutually distrusting uh, policy that is being enforced. Um, so unlike Trust Zone also, we don't just have the secure and non-secure worlds. Uh, we can spawn more than one protected VM. Uh, actually, we can spawn hundreds or even tens of thousands of them. Uh, and so this, this allows uh, a much, much higher level of isolation and is much more flexible in terms of architecture than what uh, Trust Zone allows. So PVMs are containers in a way, and so we can run whatever we want in them, including something that looks much more like Linux. So in terms of uh, uh, execution model, uh, we can also provide uh, this illusion that the kernel owns uh, the hardware, which is the whole point of virtualization, which uh, trusted applications or uh, TEs uh, don't have. So the, they are usually uh, even driven um, and aware of uh, running in, in, the, in the secure world. And it is, it, 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 it is intended to be secure, of course. And so the hypervisor itself is built uh, from the grounds up with uh, basically one goal in mind, which is to implement this isolation. And that, is, that means that the, 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 the code in the, in the hypervisor should be small and should, in theory, um, be less likely to have vulnerabilities than code that is written for, to provide functionality. Um, so in Android, we have implemented what we call the protected KVM, which is an extension of uh, regular Linux KVM. Um, and we are in the process of um, slowly upstreaming it uh, to, to upstream Linux, but all of the code is already in, in Android mainline. Um, and a side note on this, AVF itself, and I will talk more about the, the, the framework um, uh, from a higher level later, but 
is doesn't mandate the use of PKVM. So any hypervisor that can enforce this isolation um, is, uh, is would be compatible with with, with AVF. Um, but we, of course, recommend using uh, PKVM. So in terms of 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 the the way AVF expects virtualization to, to happen. Um, it, it is very close to what KVM does, if uh, you're familiar with that. So there is a user space process called uh, the virtual machine monitor, which talks to the kernel, so to KVM more specifically, to configure the virtual machine. And then um, the virtual machine becomes uh, basically user space code to the kernel scheduler and uh, it gets scheduled in and out, uh, the, the, the VMs. Um, and the VMM is also configures the memory that will be donated to the guest. And this is how it typically loads the kernel, RAM disk, firmware tables, and so on, um, by simply uh, mapping them in that memory before the guest starts running. So with PKVM, we simply extend this model. Uh, we add a protected hypervisor within KVM, so the interface to the VMM remains mostly unmodified. And uh, the big difference is that now, once the guest starts running, uh, the hypervisor itself, through the use of the uh, MMU, uh, prevents the VMM, uh, or the host for that matter, to access the memory that was donated to the guest. So the host is still in charge of scheduling the guest's uh, vCPU threads, and the, go the host could prevent a guest from running, and this is something that uh, is uh, fine by the AVF thread model. So we don't guarantee availability, and we only guarantee confidentiality and integrity of the data. So that means that if the host gets compromised, um, all the attacker in theory could do is to stop the guest from running, but we wouldn't leak any, any information. So we have, in theory, this framework can obviously boot any kernel, a uh, guest kernel, I mean, um, but we have one, one project within the AVF framework called Microdroid, where we maintain a kernel that looks a lot like uh, Android and is uh, tuned for PVMs. So what we want is, as I said, the original goal was to have those payloads moved into a protected container. And so typically those payloads would be user space um, payloads. And so we need a kernel to run them. And because the payloads as of today are mostly coming from Android, um, having something that looks like Android inside of the PVM makes sense. So we support the typical MDK, um, so it's all bionic, basically what, what the Android user space would expect. Uh, we have APKs and APXs just like Android. We have RPC with, uh, um, we have binder over RPC with the, the, main, the main, the host and the main binder running on the host. So uh, guest processes can uh, communicate back with the host, and we have obviously all of the all of the security features that exist in uh, the host in the guest, and all of the debug tools. Um, so there are some things we don't have. So we don't have Java, and uh, that is a choice. We could have it. Um, the main reason why we don't have it is to to make the whole the payloads smaller. Uh, and because we haven't had a need for it. And interestingly enough, um, no one has complained about Java not being available. So that's pretty much a good thing when we want to, to build a secure environment. Um, and we don't have um, Zygote, we don't, we don't have support for graphics, we don't have uh, support for displays, uh, we don't have HALs. Um, that might change, but um, um, supporting the display, for example, would, would require some hardware support directly. Um, it's because we can't go through back through the host. So my, what Microdroid does, Microdroid is more than a kernel, it's also a, a user space component. So the, the user space looks also a lot like 
uh, what Android has. So in it is pretty much what we have in Android. Um, and what MicroDroid is, is, is programmed to do is, well, with the MicroDroid Manager, which we call it, is to basically receive an APK payload from the host, verify that, and run it. Um, and so this is this APK would contain this uh, uh, sensitive payload. And we've been working hard to make the, the, the images of the kernel and run this uh, smaller and smaller over time, and um, we want them to boot as fast as possible. I have added some links here to the dev config for the microdroid kernel, which is built from the Android mainline kernel, uh, for those interested. And um, um, a link to the pre-built if you want to uh, learn more about the, the nitty-gritty details of how uh, we've, uh, we've made it uh, uh, smaller. So protected, if, if, you've, if you've noticed, there was a bit of a discrepancy in, uh, in what I've said here, in the sense that uh, I've been saying that uh, the host would not be trusted, because if the host is compromised, uh, then we don't want it to be uh, able to access uh, the data of the guest. But I also said that we kept the KVM architecture pretty much unchanged, including uh, the VMM loading the guest image. And so an obvious attack would be for uh, the host to load a modified version of, say, MicroDroid, for example, and uh, to basically modify the instructions to inject a, a backdoor or something like that. So the way we prevent this is um, by verifying the image that has been loaded before the image is, loaded, is booted. Um, and we also have to verify the platform itself, because the, the virtual platform is programmed by the, by the VMM. And so we could do this in the hypervisor, in theory. Um, but we don't want to, as I said, because uh, we want to keep the hypervisor as small as possible, and uh, this would increase the, 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 the TCB of the, of, the, of the hypervisor pretty significant, significantly, because we would have to, to, to add all of the, of the logic for, for the verification and all those protocols and so on. Um, so instead, we've introduced um, a trusted piece of software, uh, which uh, we call the protected virtual machine firmware, which is injected into the guest me uh, memory by the hypervisor at boot time, at PVM boot time. So when the VMM uh, tells the KVM kernel that the, the guest can run for the first time, then all of the memory that was assigned to the guest is transferred in terms of ownership so the host cannot access it anymore. And only at that point does the hypervisor um, inject the uh, PVM firmware on uh, entry point and redirects the PC of uh, the vCPU to the entry point of that, uh, of that firmware. So that means that we have the guarantee from the hypervisor that PVM firmware will run inside of the PVM before anything else. And um, then we can implement all of the payload verification logic inside of PVM firmware. But the interesting uh, aspect is that now this code is running in guest context. So it is deprivileged. Um, and so if there is a vulnerability in PVM firmware, for example, um, all the host could do would be to attack the guest. So it can't attack the hypervisor itself. Um, but from the perspective of the guest, then because PVM firmware will run before it gets to run, uh, it is um, basically an extension of the hypervisor. And if PVM firmware sees anything wrong with the, the guest or the virtual platform, it simply aborts the, the boot process, uh, preventing the guest from, from even running and returns to the, to the host. So the VMM uh, will also interact, or the PVM firmware will interact with the VMM through the, the virtual platform. And so from the perspective of the VMM, uh, the PVM firmware is just a guest. And so PVM firmware doesn't have any sort of uh, extra privilege uh, that could be used to attack the VMM uh, by exploiting, for example, a vulnerability in the, 
in the PDM firmware or PDM firmware interface. Um, so when we look at this, so PVM firmware, as I said, runs in, in, in guest context. So it runs at uh, EL1, and it uh, is booted on a, on a freshly booted PVM. So it looks a lot like some sort of bare metal bootloader, although it doesn't load anything. Um, so it has to set up its own runtime environment. Uh, it has to manage the system, the page tables, uh, exceptions, uh, do CMOs, that kind of stuff. Um, it has to implement device drivers if it wants to use those devices. Uh, and, uh, and we do use uh, um, the block device, for example, for, for keeping track of, uh, of, of sorts uh, for cryptography. And it has to be, of course, aware of where the images that have been loaded by the VMM are and uh, to verify those. And it runs from a pretty restricted uh, region of uh, virtual memory. So the, the VMM um, defines the memory layout of the, of the guests and uh, PVM from where it gets four megs. Uh, and so this, these four megs are split into two megs being injected by the, by the hypervisor and the extra two megs are there for, for its uh, basically scratch memory. Um, but it has to do all of that, and unlike most, I guess, bootloaders running on physical hardware, it has to do all of that while uh, uh, being aware that the, the hardware or the virtual hardware could be trying to attack it. And so in Android 14, um, we were using a build of U-Boot. Um, and it was actually a build of the AOSP fork of U-Boot. Um, and in Android 14, we've uh, rewritten PVM firmware from scratch. So today, uh, Android 14 um, is about to be released, and PVM firmware will be fully part of the Android open source project code base. Um, so it is built uh, as part of Android and it is fully integrated with the build system um, because with, with U-Boot we had to build U-Boot to get PVM firmware and then drop a pre-build. So this is much more transparent and um, it has been written in Rust. Um, so there is a, a big effort in, uh, in Android to introduce Rust, um, but most of the, this effort deals with user space, of course. And uh, this was a good opportunity to try out Rust in an embedded environment. So bare, bare metal in a sense, although it isn't really bare metal. But, um, so this was, this was an interesting, interesting experiment. Uh, and we contributed beyond Android to the, the Rust ecosystem. So we created two crates, which we published on crates.io. For, so the first one is for managing uh, page tables in AR64. Um, and the second one is for using the um, SMCC, uh, SMC interface, which is an ARM standard interface for talking to either the hypervisor in our case or the secure monitor. Um, and we have extended the most popular, I guess, Vertio implementation uh, by modifying it so that it was compatible with the AVF uh, threat model because uh, typically Vertio implementations trust the Vertio backend um, with the memory that's being shared, but in our case, uh, well, that, that's not the case. So we, we had to modify, to modify it so that the, the, the driver itself doesn't trust the device. And we still have some C code in there and some C++ code, um, mostly for fairly mature libraries. So we use, we have to, to deal with uh, the device tree of the guest uh, when we verify the platform. So we'll use libfdt for that. Um, then Boring SSL for, for all of the, the crypto. And, uh, and Open Dice is uh, something I haven't mentioned, uh, but which we can discuss, but it's for for cryptography so, uh, and attestation. So basically, PVM firmware will provide um, to the guest a certificate 
that attests of the boot chain um, that goes from the guest all the way to the hypervisor, and it can even extend in, in theory uh, to the, the ROM code of the, of the device itself. Um, and that can also, that means also that the, the guest is able to do cryptography with keys that were never touched by the, by the host. Um, so what are the next steps? Um, so for AVF, we, are, we, we want to, to extend what, the, what PVMs are capable of. So one big feature in particular for moving payloads from the CK world to, uh, to PVMs is to have some sort of device pass-through. So being able to access the physical hardware directly from PVMs. Um, and if, if you want to, 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 to keep, to have a smooth transition between, between secure and protected non-secure, uh, we need also to put in place some standardized uh, VM to, to trust zone communication channels uh, with, with the challenges that come with it, trust zone being so fragmented. So for our hypervisor implementation, so for PKVM, um, we are basically extending it to, to, we would have to extend it to support those new use cases. Um, so device pass-through being, uh, being a big one. Um, but we are also improving it in the background, in a sense, um, to improve performance uh, in, in, uh, in different ways. Um, so to reduce, for example, the the number of back and forth between L1 and L2 uh, or to uh, improve the way memory is being mapped into the guest. And of course, the upstreaming effort is, is, is very important to us. Um, and so for, for PVM firmware, well, I would say it's, it's pretty much done um, uh, right now. Uh, but of course, if we add more, more support for more features, such as device pass-through, PVM firmware will have to be um, extended to implement the verification that uh, will come with that. Um, and, and I have some ideas for um, making it faster, but uh, we'll see if that's, if that's required. And so that is pretty much the end. Um, there is a lot of documentation available on uh, source.android.com about AVF, the different parts of AVF. I barely mentioned user space. A lot of work went into um, building uh, um, the AVF user space. So all of that is detailed there. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, follow this link or just look, uh, search for Android Virtualization Framework. Um, and, and, and you will have a lot of documentation about this there. Uh, you can give it a try um, if you have a pixel device, you can boot uh, AVF PVMs. Uh, you can even boot them with your own kernel uh, if you want to, or you can boot them with your payload and that will run with microdrive. Um, and if you have any questions, you can uh, email about this talk, you can email, email me directly, or if it's about AVF in general, um, you can email this, uh, this uh, mailing list. All right, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, the subject. It was really interesting. Uh, just a question regarding the, um, the PVM space. Uh, is there any uh, special communication between the PV PVM uh, kernel and the main kernel? If that's the case, does uh, the system fallbacks with the main kernel if something wrong uh, happens to the uh, PVM? So um, I guess the main one way is the, the, so those device drivers. So we use Vertio. Uh, and, and so that technically talks to the, the host kernel. Um, so as I briefly mentioned, we've had to and rework the, the, those drivers so that they don't trust the device, uh, which, which the kernel could abuse. Um, so those, those patches uh, have, were merged in, in U-Boot, because back then we were using U-Boot for Android 13 and, uh, and Linux uh, last year. Um, but beyond that, well, that's pretty much the only communication channel we have between the two, the two kernels. Um, but obviously, this means that even though PVM firmware 
verifies, in a sense, the platform. Um, the platform is still implemented by the, by, the, by the VMM. And so you get some sort of a doctor risk there, right? So that the drivers inside of the guest kernel have to be aware that they're running in the PVM uh, so that they, they are secure, basically. Cannot hear you. Uh -oh. oh, perfect. And so you mentioned PVM firmware um, goes and verifies a bunch of things, signs um, dice reports and so on before jumping into the guest whilst in the VM. Um, how does it verify the virtual environment? So like the, the memory layout of the guest, does it get a blob from P, uh, PKVM itself or does it have to call up into PKVM to go and actually verify that the provided information from the normal world is right. trustworthy? So, so PVM firmware is uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, the layout of the virtual platform um, is mostly tuned for cross VM, which is the VMM we use. So it wouldn't work out of the box with a QMU, for example, uh, although nothing would prevent us from extending it to, to support that use case. Um, so it, it has knowledge about what cross VM should do and shouldn't do. And then it, uh, it validates to so the device tree, for example. So it, uh, it parses that and, and makes sure that what the guest kernel will see and the drivers the guest kernel will, uh, will load um, are what is expected from, from, from CrossVM to have, to have configured. But as I said, right, we have a PCI, a virtual PCI bus, for example. So you, 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 you can't um, fully verify that uh, the, the, the PCI bus is what it pretends to be. From the device tree alone. Yeah, I, uh, I just meant like the physical memory layout. I meant more basic, like just the physical memory layout. So if we tell the guest you've got two gig of RAM at zero x eight whatever, yeah. and that's going to be the device tree for the guest. Yeah. How does PVM firmware verify that you actually have RAM there? Does it have to ask PKVM, or does it just trust that PKVM has previously verified that? No, it doesn't. And it doesn't verify it either. Um, so, if and PVM from I won't uh, touch every single page of that memory for for a good reason. Uh, but the uh, what what would so what would happen is let, let's say you, you tell the, the the guest that you have. Uh, that much memory and, and that wasn't actually allocated by the VMM, what will happen is that the guest will try to access those pages. Uh, they will trigger a stage two fault in the MMU, which will be uh, handled by EL2. And the way EL2 handles it in PKVM, and that's different from regular KVM, is that it then injects a virtual uh, exception in the guest to let it know that uh, a default happened. And so, um, in that case, well, the, the guest can, can take the, the uh, appropriate actions. So now, for those, the, 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 the particular case of pages that contain uh, data from the images that are being verified by PVM firmware, PVM firmware will obviously have to read those, so it will touch them, which means that the, the memory is, is there. But, uh, but you typically have more, hopefully, more memory than, than just the size of your, of your images. And, okay, and, yeah, and the, the reason why PVM format doesn't touch all of the memory is because we do, um, uh, we page uh, guest memory in lazily uh, to reduce the amount of uh, memory consumption of, on the overall system that guests have. So if you boot a guest with, say, two gigs of, uh, of virtual memory, we don't, from the start, allocate and, and lock down two gigs of physical memory. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question because you mentioned that you uh, be, you are being able to load the uh, APK application in that way, but the environment is very limited without a GDK or graphical st uh, um, stack, etc. So what is the interest to support this format and all the secured application in fact can be deployed in, in production for a device because I can imagine is not a, you cannot use a Google Store, for example, to be able to use this kind of feature. So what is a model to distribute a secured application in that way? Um, 
So it, it, it is more limited than the Android kernel, but it is not that limited. So that we, we do get a lot of infrastructure for, for supporting the, the format and so on. Uh, and, and that's, that's essentially the reason why we, we are using it, so that we can reuse a lot of the, of the, of the, the infrastructure that exists today in, in Android user space inside of uh, the MicroJet user space. And uh, it all just works. OK, thank you. Um, so you mentioned that it is uh, usable on the Pixel phones with Android 14. Would it, so what do I need to do for that? Is, is it accessible to uh, a, yeah, a phone not in developer mode from a normal AP, uh, APKG? Um, so for, actually if you have a Pixel 6, you can flash a build which enables AVF. Um, so AVF was not enabled by default on Pixel 6, build shift. Um, and starting with Pixel 7, uh, we, we started shipping uh, AVF, which was uh, enabled by default. So depending on the, the, the model you have, you would have to flash a particular build or not. Um, uh, so the, the, the permissions are not restricted in the Play Store? So no, they are. So, so you, need to have a, you need to have root privilege to, to ah. run those tests. Yeah. So you need to be in a, in a, in a debug mode. Uh, could you give some examples for the kind of trusted applications that you would migrate into PKVM? Right. Um, so this is really up to the owners of those uh, trusted applications. Um, and what we're building here is mostly an infrastructure. Um, so we, we don't necessarily have one particular uh, use case we are targeting. but. Um, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've, uh, so recently there were some, 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 some leaked, there was some leaked code of a, a major vendor uh, which, which made it public on uh, what was running inside of those uh, trusted applications. And uh, I mean, it makes sense to have some, some low level device drivers for what they call secure uh, hardware, which is, as I mentioned, enforced, uh, prevented, which cannot be accessed from the from non-secure uh, due to the preventions put, put in place at the bus level. But what those leaks showed is that non-secure uh, EL0 can be running stuff like an HTML5 parser. Uh, and if, 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 you, if you have an application way which needs to receive JavaScript and run it, might not be a very good idea to run it in the in the secure world, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, what I was wondering about, because the uh, usual case, at least how uh, what I have seen for trust application, is that you have access to some secrets that's only available in the trust zone, but when you move it into um, a PKVM, um, you are not, um, yeah, you can get, I, I, you can get to the secret if you uh, have a vulnerability in EL2 instead of ha having to have a vulnerability in the secure monitor and in Opti. Exactly. So, so uh, if you want to move that kind of, uh, of, uh, of use case, you have two options. Basically, you rework the hardware so that you don't have this uh, secure, non-secure access permission anymore, and therefore you can access it from, from a PVM, which means that you can also access it from, uh, from EL2 if, if it gets compromised, as you said. Um, the other option is you keep that in place, um, so only secure can access it, and you really limit the amount of code you have in secure world to accessing the hardware. And then you expose some sort of service, and this is one of the things I mentioned on this slide, uh, to PVMs, uh, with, and this is where attestation comes into the picture, uh, where the service running inside of the secure world would have, would be this, this tiny firmware which accesses the, the hardware and exposes the service and checks the, uh, the, the, the certificates. And, and then all of the higher level business logic would run inside of the PDM. Thank you. Uh, do you envision a model where you would run virtually all the APKs inside uh, MicroDroid and could they be short-lived? Like you just run them to completion and then just destroy the VM, for instance. And the second question would be, 
what sort of overhead have you measured when you do something like that, for instance? Yeah, right. Um, so, well, I guess your second question answers your first question. That's the main limitation, right? Um, the other limitation is that you cannot swap guest memory because swapping is done by the kernel, the host kernel, and the host kernel doesn't have access to those physical pages anymore. Um, so that puts some constraints on the, on the, on the host, and, uh, and I think that if we want to start running all of the APKs, for example, or whatever, um, in almost most of Android inside of, of uh, PVMs, then, then we will need to solve these issues. In terms of uh, o o overhead, uh, Orders of magnitude, booting a PVM today takes about a second uh, and has an overhead of roughly 60 megs, something like that. Um, so, of course, it's much more costly than a process, right? So, um, so I don't think in the near future we will, we will have a model where most of Android is running in, in PVMs. But very long term, I think that's a, that would be a very good model to re-architect. For example, we could dream of running vendor halves inside of, uh, of PVMs, things like that. Thank you. And um, are you talking to Silicon vendors about that and how is the adoption going? Like with, for instance, Qualcomm already has their own hypervisor and their own trusted VM and trusted UI VM and stuff like that? Um, so, yes, we are, of course, and uh, we are talking uh, with them. And uh, as I mentioned, AVF doesn't mandate uh, using PKVM as a hypervisor, and this is one of the main reasons. Um, so, 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 so Qualcomm, if they want to, uh, allowed to use their own hypervisor there, as long as it uh, implements the features that AVF expects from the AVF hypervisor. I actually had a similar question. Like in, Early in the slides, you showed that one of the threat models is actually through the TEE and through trusted apps themselves. And as we know, chip vendors are fond of shipping their customized TEEs and in, in closed source, you know, trusted apps. And that threat model still exists. So are you, are you in Android, are you saying you have to, is there a, only one TEE that you trust? Or are you just encouraging vendors to shift more of that stuff into, PKV, or into PVMs? Or how's that enforcement going to happen? Well, we're not really going to enforce anything. Uh, this, is, it, this is very hard because um, with, with, with Android, uh, Google has been saying uh, since the start, uh, there's the kernel and user space, this is Android, and then th that's where it stops, right? The rest is vendor, and that's, that's none of our business. And so it becomes very hard for us to, to, to try to, to have some sort of influence on, on the code that is running there. Um, and I, I mentioned this briefly, but I think that one of the strengths of PVMs is to make all of this more transparent. So a lot of this code could, or might not be, but could become open source uh, and would be much easier to, to update uh, than, 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 than having to use those uh, vendor solutions per TE. Um, of course, this, as you might expect, causes some friction. Right. Thank you very much.